All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Cindy Coulter. I am not a professional <laughs> anything about this. I'm just a person who loves plants. And um, I started an interest in plants when I was probably eight years old. I read my first wilderness survival book when I was eight, and I just got hooked on trying to figure out how did people how did people do things before we had like the grocery store and all this, you know, all the modern conveniences that we have today. So um, that sparked an interest uh, for me when I was really young. I grew up in Las Vegas. I'm a fifth generation Idahoan, uh, born in Boise, but I uh, brought my kids back in 91 to raise them here. And I think none of us have any regrets about that. Um, I get them out into the mountains still, even though we're all grown ups now and, and we still do a lot of you know plant things. I'm a lousy hiker though, I have to confess. I'm the one that's way back in the back on my hands and knees taking a picture of a plant with my butt in the air and people are usually taking a picture of me as they fly by on their hike. So anyway, sorry about that, but I hope to get in on some of your field crews though. That'll be fun. Even if I'm just a camp cook. How does it go? Which one do I click? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so just think about for a minute the traditional plant uses, what, what plants were used for and what, um, you know, we've come a long way. We don't really rely on these things anymore, just overtly, but we still, that's what we find in the store. They're all a part of, um, they all were handed down to us from all this, you know, from primitive peoples eons ago. So. Think about how, what parts of the plants were used for what. And by the way, this can be um, available if anybody wants uh, a copy of this. So just let me know. Uh. <laughs> okay. All right. So first we'll cover wood. It's used for all kinds of really basic things. So if, if you're, out on this long open ridge and it's real rocky and scrabbly and you've got the whole world out in front of you and you're looking just one time with your, with your camera and you're trying to get this awesome photo and you set your backpack down and it goes tumbling down to the bottom and, and, and it's like getting dark. <laughs> what do you do? Well, so the first thing you probably want to know is um, what kind of wood can I, can I use to make um, a shelter? How can I, what is best for starting uh, a fire? So these are some of the wood, our little wood friends. And I'm just going to let you kind of read along here um, what these are good for. One of our um, most common, well, the Boise, Les Bois, Les Bois was all the cottonwoods in the Boise River Valley. And cottonwoods, uh, the buds come from, uh, are really historically known, Balm of Gilead. And if you've ever gone out this time of year and along the river, you, you pick up the blown down little pieces of um, the little twigs from the cottonwoods and you pick it up and you can pick off the little buds and you smell them and they just smell like heaven. They smell like vanilla or something, they're really good. You can collect those and they'll still smell good for a long time after that. Mountain mahogany. Um, Gosh, this one's just such a great plant. Uh, really hard wood. This one's in the rose family. And I think you'll find most of the plants in the rose family have really hard wood. And most of them have edible fruit. This one does not. The pines have uh, so many properties that we've used for uh, millennia. From the uh, tea, if you have a, a, a pine tree in your yard, you can go out and, and collect the fresh buds and make tea. Just bring it in and make some tea with it. If you've got a cold, this will help you get over your cold really fast. Rocky Mountain Maple. This is a small, smallish tree. It's a deciduous. It's kind of more of a large shrub than, and a small tree. It's usually multi-trunked tree. It has the little winged seeds on there really good wood for um, this is a good friend if you need to build like a quick shelter because it has a lot of twigs down at the base 
our state flower, syringa. A lot of bows and arrows were made from syringa or bows, or arrows rather. Um, straight shooter. <laughs> and then I guess another thing you'd want to know if you were stuck out there is what can I eat? Well, it depends on the time of the year, but if you're hiking the summertime and you're up in the, in the elevation, you're going to have to wait until probably late in the season before most fruits are ready. But there's really kind of a long season for some of these fruits that you can gather. All of these berries um, are in the vaccinium family, the huckleberries, um, the grouse whortleberry. This is one of my favorite ones right here it's just a tiny little plant has anybody ever had a grouse whortleberry so you know it's like match head size teeny tiny little berry but if you put it in your mouth it's like <laughs> wow really cool stuff and then you've got these big leaves on the thimbleberry and salmonberry have really big leaves like this so those were used for wrapping food for warming for baking and for storage which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. If you're out there and you don't have utensils or whatever, what are you going to use? So that's kind of a nice thing to know, too, in addition to the fruit. Strawberries. Got to love strawberries. And choke cherries. So um, the thing to know about cherries, this is really interesting that if you look at the leaf, at the base of the leaf and right there at the stem, there are two little tiny um, glands, and that's how you identify the cherries. If it's a cherry, it's going to have, you can barely see it here, but there are two little tiny, just really small, they look like little bugs at the base of the leaf there, uh, and that is the, all of the cherry family, that's a diagnostic character of the cherry leaves, no matter what kind of cherry it is. So this is what the uh, ripe uh, cherries, choke cherries look like in the wild, and this is when they're cultivated. They, they're really large and juicy. But you don't want to probably go pop in any one of those in your mouth, and if you have, you know why. <laughs> this is pretty sour, <laughs> pretty astringent. Um, all the gooseberries uh, and currants, um, the way to identify those is that they have a, like a, a remnant of the flower that kind of sticks down from the bottom of them, almost all of them have that even after the fruit is ripe. So that's a good way to identify those. Um, the gooseberries kind of loosely will be the ones with the thorns and the prickles, and the currants are the ones that are a little bit nicer to handle. Not always the case, but that's just a, a loose rule of thumb. Douglas Hawthorne, this guy has formidable thorns here, and the native peoples used that those thorns for uh, fashioning hooks and awls, fish hooks. So if you're really starving, you probably figure out a way to do that. And the bark from trees makes a really good glue. You have to kind of find a way to heat it up. And Lynn's going to talk about that a little more in her presentation. But um, it seems like a real challenge to me. But if you were out there and if you just wanted to um, impose that on yourself, you could probably do a lot of practicing. Can you look at awl? Oh, an awl is like a needle. Um, something that you would like poke or use it as a tool, a sharp pointed, like a pointed stick, but not in the eye, hopefully. <laughs> elderberries, the, the thing about elderberries, so you, um, you're driving along, you're hiking along, you're looking down um, above, above the creek, and there's a beautiful big bush, and it, it'll start out with creamy, like big flat panicles of uh, flowers, white flowers in the spring and then they'll come along and, and as the berries mature they'll get to be blue and they're so heavy they just droop the whole thing down and they're just loaded with berries. I made a really good kind of a, a blueberry uh, bread one time you know like you think th pumpkin bread and all that and I used um, elderberries and they were really tasty but the thing about them was they were real gritty <laughs> so you might want to just use the juice instead of the whole berry. But I didn't get any complaints. So um, stay away from the red ones on the elderberries. Oak leaf sumac, if you're thirsty, you're out in, uh, oh, and I've got, a, I've got a piece of oak leaf sumac here. And um, you want to know this. You can pass that around. Don't get this sticky stuff on your fingers or it'll, you'll smell like that the rest of the night. <laughs> So one of the alternate names for this is skunk leaf sumac, and if you smell it, you can 
tell why they call it skunk leaf sumac. But if you take the berries and they're really small berries and they're kind of papery, they're not they're not real juicy berries. But if you pop them into a cup of water and cover it, or uh, yeah, a cup and cover it with water and just let it steep for an hour or so, and then you filter it off. Like if you have pour over coffee and you have a little filter, you can pour that pour that in there and filter out the the stuff. And it makes a nice little lemonade type beverage. It's real thirst quenching. Service berries are awesome. Um, they taste to me kind of like they have, so they've got little teeny edible seeds in there. They kind of have a flavor like an almond. And again, in the rose family. Speaking of roses, and this is true of most of these shrub uh, fruits. You wait until the frost kind of hits them. So looking at these, Roses here, they're all bright and shiny. That's not when to harvest a rose hip. You harvest, you guys probably all know this, but you harvest it after the first frost and they kind of shrivel up, they get a little darker. Um, don't harvest things that are all black or, you know, like look like insects have beat you to it, but just the nice, really pretty ones. But uh, they will be shriveled up when they're really decent to eat. These in particular, if you haven't ever opened one up, just um, experiment this fall after the first frost. Pop it open and you'll see a bunch of hairs and some little tiny seeds in there. You can scoop those out real easy with your fingernail. And then you just pile a bunch of those and you don't even have to scoop out the hairs and, and seeds for tea. And it's a really delicious tea. Very good for colds and whatever ails you. Okay, now we'll just talk about some of the nice um, things that you can add to a salad or uh, use for flavoring. This one is a really good pot herb. So fireweed is one of the early colonizers, and you probably know this. After a fire, you can see all these uh, charred trunks. And it's a really beautiful plant, too. I have it growing at home. Such a pretty plant. So if you're looking in the spring to identify this, what you want to look for is the standing stalks from last year. And then you'll see the little tiny shoots coming up all around those stalks. And this is what a, a whole big thicket will look like. This is their seed. And um, this is kind of what, what they'll look like is uh, the, the next year. So the seeds will dehiss. They, they open up and they, they release all of this fluffy um, where the seed material is. And that's pretty persistent. So you should still be able to see some of that in the spring. This is probably one of the best trail sites. Anybody ever had this? Yes. <laughs> what did you think? It was pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Well, really mild and succulent and, and thirst quenching. It's pretty cool. So this grows like if you're looking at a, a kind of a seepy bank um, underneath a sagebrush or some kind of a shrub and it's a kind of a cut bank and just a seepy area there. That's where you're going to find this, where it gets a lot of shade and you can see that it's growing with uh, the fern look, fern type leaf there is yarrow. So it'll grow with a lot of those other things. Sticky geranium is another one that, so does everybody know what astringent is? Um, so if you've got a wound and it's real puffy and, and swollen and sore and everything, what you want is, is something astringent to kind of suck that down and make it, you know, like not so swollen and, and painful and achy. So a lot of these native plants have, um, have some astringency involved, and they're really good, beneficial plants. Anybody ever been stung by sting nettles? It's just, it's just so delightful. So I don't have a picture of yellow dock in here, but you all know what do yellow dock is. It's tall, it's got kind of rusty uh, seed heads, it's in a lot of waste areas. So the juice from those leaves will help alleviate the sting from that. And as soon as you, so you want to collect those with gloves or whatever, uh, protect yourself and as soon as you uh, get those heated up put them in boiling water or uh, pour boiling water over the top of them then the little stinging hairs are disarmed and they won't bite you anymore and they're really yummy then you get a bite in lots of violets um, in our part of the world this one's real common around here I think is it back with you and um, Everywhere you go, they come out real early in the spring. And, you know, you look at the garden centers, you're going to see them coming out pretty soon. They really like cool weather. But they, uh, they'll hang out on the top of these wide open sunny slopes, too. 
but they're, you're not going to see them tolerating a lot of heat. So this is a good one to know early in the season. Wild onion. Um, has anybody ever eaten wild onion um, out there? So it just smells like, this is the big tip on wild onion, is to always make sure that it smells like an onion. I've got a, I've got a piece of an onion here. In case you need to know what an onion smells like. Um, if it doesn't smell like wild onion, um, pass it up because that same type of a plant and same type of habitat can be um, a toxic plant. The, the family has a lot of toxic plants, so just be sure by smelling it and yum. <laughs> and then the, what you need to know about these bulbs is they're tiny and they're really, they're, a lot of times they'll be really deep and, and so you dig and you dig and you dig and you end up with this little thumbnail sized piece of onion bit. <laughs> So, really the green part's the best part. Okay, has anybody ever tried the tubers from Arrowhead? This is the, the famous Wapato. Anybody tried that? It's like a potato. So, you can cook them like a potato or you can uh, dig up, just like a potato, dig up the, the uh, tubers, slice them really thin, grind them, you know, dry them out and then grind them when they're dry and use it for flour. This was a really nutritious plant that the native peoples used. Bitterroot is legendary in the, um, the Montana Bitterroot Valley, got its name. I think it's the Montana State Flower, pretty sure. And um, it's really neat. It just dries up and goes away after it's done blooming, which is kind of um, early, late spring, early summer. And then it looks like a bunch of just little papers. But um, you can identify it once you get to know what it looks like, the little succulent pods there and then the little papery flowers that, that will dry up and then they just blow across the desert. They grow in amazingly shallow, poor soils on wide open rocky sites. Camas. <sighs> And then um, there, there was a picture here of a death camas, which is sort of like this, but it's white. It's got a white, uh, you don't want to mix them up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and they bloom together at the same time of the year, basically. Um, this one, uh, the blue camas will bloom a little bit earlier, I think, typically. And the, uh, the death camas is a little more persistent. And it's a different t type of flower completely different. This one's kind of a spidery looking flower and the death camas is uh, more of a lily looking flower and a whole bunch of flowers on a spike. So they're not that hard once you get to knowing what to look for. They're not that hard to tell apart. But be really, really careful when you're harvesting any of these bulbs for food. Cattail, the whole darn thing is just, just, just a good guy. <laughs> And uh, Lynn's going to talk a little more about cattails. She brought some baskets, I think, were, were cattails that are just beautiful. Um, I haven't tried it, but the young flower heads like this, um, roasting them and eating them like corn on the cob just sounds like so much fun, doesn't it? And these plants are really abundant. Uh, so it's not like you're going to, you know, you, you get half a dozen of them for dinner and you try them out. It's not like you're going to impact the whole uh, ecosystem by harvesting a few of these at all. Ah, these lilies are so pretty. Um, I think they used to be pretty abundant and in some places they still are. This is up uh, in the south fork of the Payette River drainage. You can still see swales where... Um, where they're pretty abundant. And that's where, if you were going to sample any of these, sample them from areas that, where they're really abundant. Don't just go out in the desert, like this is poor little lone guy was out there just going, ah. <laughs> Actually, it was, really, it was really pretty. He was more jubilant than that. But all by himself, you know? So make sure when you harvest these that you're harvesting from an area where there are a lot of them. So you're not gonna uh, damage the population. Pond lilies this is kind of cool. You um, go out in, in the fall and when, you know, when seeds are always ripening in the fall, right? Because it takes the whole season and lots of sunshine. And um, then you just clip those little, uh, just take the flower part off, what was the flower, and put them in a basket and dry them out. And you, you take those seeds and they're supposed to make pretty darn good popcorn. I haven't tried it. 
but you can also grind the seeds for flour. And besides, then you've got all the fun of wading out into the pond, right? Lynn's going to talk more about uh, flexible stems and, and weaving and everything, but I'll just introduce you to a few of these. Milkweed, um, who hasn't smelled milkweed in the, in the summer and, and thought, man, that just smells like heaven. That's so pretty. Um, and then they have these really cool little, do you guys like bugs? Do you like insects? I, I love little insects. It's got this really cool little uh, red milkweed beetle that hangs out on these pods. So if you, if you see a milkweed, go check it out and see if you can spot some of those little red milkweed beetles. They're pretty cool. <sighs> well, so this was dogwood. <laughs> these are the flowers. These are the leaves. And there was, uh, anyway, so dogwood's got really uh, red stems, okay? So they're really easy to spot. You'll see them all over. They're kind of an understory plant in our area. And the, uh, the wood is real flexible. It's used in a lot of basketry. I think typically was, uh, I think about the uh, Council Springs Road now and, and how it used to be called Squaw Creek Road. And I, I lived up there for a couple years without running water. Anyway, um, <laughs> it annoyed me when they, when they renamed it from Squaw Creek to to Council Spring, not because I thought the squaw was a good name, but because you think of the council, a council's a man thing, right? And, and it was just all over up in there were these dogwoods and willows. And I'm thinking, you know, here, here's, they're, they're giving everybody in the future the wrong idea. This was a woman place. It should have been Basket Willow Creek or something like that, right? From all these dogwoods. So anyway, I'm not very politically correct, I guess. And then the willows, um, typically they're in real wet places. And uh, if you can hear the very raucous call of the yellow-headed blackbird in the upper corner there, you're, you're in good uh, position to spot some willows because they love to hang out there. This is from, um, from the willow and the cottonwoods. The, uh, that whole uh, genus is really good for aspirin substitutes. So the inner bark, you can take the inner bark and make tea out of it, and it'll be a really good analgesic, a way to alleviate pain and reduce inflammation. And you get to talk about the basketry. Ah. That red one is growing in my yard. This is the native one, uh, the little, the white ones, kind of creamy flowered ones. Uh, and I think there is a native one that has red flowers, isn't there, in northern Idaho? Uh-huh. And anyway, these are just beautiful flowers. But the, the leaves are real kind of astringent. They're real zingy. The, um, historically, the root was uh, powdered for alum and it was used to keep pickles crisp so my grandma would put she would have this great big old container of pickles and uh, she'd be out there they would be oh they'd smell so good too with dill and all of these pickles would be in this big old tub and she would put alum in there to keep the pickles crisp because you know um, in the summertime pickles don't stay crisp very easily so that's one of the things it was used for it's also um, something you don't want to use a lot of it's it's toxic in large amounts but if you take a few of these leaves and di dice them up really small and add them to a salad they're they're zingy they're they're really good <sighs> one of our favorites um, don't be thinking about this guy if you're if you're really hungry <laughs> okay they're really lovely to look at if you can if you can beat the wildlife to the seeds good for you because um, the wildlife love the seeds but the root is like 30 feet long and you have to dig and dig and dig and dig. You could probably, you know, like underneath the plant a little bit and carve away a little bit and mash it for your wound. That would be the best way to use that, I would think, because then it's going to recover too. The plant will recover. But um, basically that's what that is used for is, is for wounds, easy, simple wounds. Glow mallow, I thought this was kind of a cool thing, lining the boots with leaves to relieve blisters. That might be something we need to know, right? And if you're out there on the trail and you really want to get gussied up, 
the hair rinse adds body and curl. <laughs> so you can look great for the chipmunks. <laughs> All right, lots of different kinds of uh, goldenrod around here. Uh, they typically grow right around the water, and you're probably all really familiar with them. I did not know that the seeds were used as a thickener, and I haven't tried that, but it's worth thinking, you know, if you've got a pot of whatever you're cooking, and if you, especially you've got a, a camp and you've got a group of people, and you've you got a soup that, you're, you know, it's real thin and watery, it's like, okay, maybe I'll use some of those seeds to thicken it up. Uh, the tea on a lot of these things is really good for different parts, and I encourage you to read up. Uh, we've got some books up here if you want to look at books. Uh, this is typically what, what kept Native peoples uh, healthy. So, Anything that stops bleeding I think is a good thing to know. This one stops bleeding, and yarrow is another one that stops bleeding. Um, if you're out on the trail and you get all scuffed up, you want something that can stop the bleeding and, and keep you from getting all, you know, infected. This is a really reliable plant for instead of aspirin, and if you have an allergy to aspirin, be sure you're really careful going about all of this. Um, but this one, when you're thinking about um, willows, and cottonwood, they vary a lot from plant to plant. This, the, the strength of the active ingredient varies a lot. This one is really pretty reliable across the species. So if you take and peel the, some of the bark off of here and make a tea, uh, it'll be a more reliable uh, potency. Here's another one of those plants that you want to wait for the um, frost to sweeten the blossom or to sweeten the fruits. And uh, it makes really good jams and jellies and juice. And uh, it's just a really pretty bush, too. The bark is good for if you're out and you start feeling like you're coming down with a cold, um, make some bark tea out of this guy. Oregon grape. Or Oregon grape is a really good one. The root is good for your liver and gallbladder, and um, the whole urinary tract system is really good for uh, if you make a tea from the root of this plant. Yarrow is one of the, the most, and I've got a whole bunch of these little teeny tiny things that are just barely coming out. Probably in the foothills, you're going to find more of these um, bigger, but I've got... <laughs> I went out to the yard today because we have we have yarrow uh, in our yard instead of grass. You can just pass those around and kind of mash them between your fingers. And you're probably all really familiar with yarrow, but it just smells so good. Why not? Why not enjoy them, right? So um, this is a really good one if you skin yourself. You fall down and you get a, an elbow abrasion. Grab some yarrow and rub it on there. It's a good guy. Makes good tea too. Culturally. Well, we don't do an awful lot of smoking native stuff anymore. <laughs> well, theoretically, who knows? There was that load of hemp, right? <laughs> um, this is a really, uh, this is a really good plant for really well known for tobacco. The wood is really hard, and it's a small plant. It's just a little understory plant. Typically, likes uh, sheltered or uh, filtered light under pine trees and stuff. It'll tolerate a little bit of full sun, but not a lot of heat. So that's where you're going to find that. And the, uh, because it's a small plant, you'll have small pieces of wood to use small tools. And sagebrush. Um, sagebrush smudge. I think you've all probably seen wrapped sagebrush. And, and people will light it on fire. And it, smells, it smells so good. And the native peoples did that before their ceremonies to purify themselves. Don't eat it. <laughs> Don't eat these berries either. But the native peoples would weave these into um, their cradles to protect their babies because they were um, associated with ghosts. So to protect the babies from ghost spirits, they would weave, weave these twigs into their cradles. And then these are just a few more good guys. This is not going to keep you from starving. But the buckwheats are beautiful, 
and um, they're great pollinator plants. So anytime you see a buckwheat, and these are all different kinds of buckwheat, um, you look out there and they're just going to be buzzing. You like to take pictures, they're buzzing with insects. Uh, go grab some great photos as you're out there. And yes, they do have seeds, but it's going to be a lot of processing to get seeds enough to sustain you. Um, the shoots of these plants when they're really young, early in the spring, um, are edible. So if you need something like that uh, to just to sustain you, it's edible. The bistort up there on the left-hand side, the white flowers, now those grow up higher in elevation, in closed basins, really moist areas, and those have an edible root. These are, um, <laughs> these are all great plants. The gentian up here, they've taken a lot of this off the market, but it's, and we don't typically eat, uh, drink bitters anymore like we used to, like our, our parents and our grandparents grew up on bitters. You got a bellyache, well, you take bitters. Well, um, we don't do that anymore because we don't like bitter. But um, the gentian root was known for being a, a good, uh, making a good bitter, and, and there are recipes for it if you're interested. So these are just a few more to get to know, friendly faces. Um, chicory root, has anybody had chicory root for coffee? Yep, yep. It's pretty darn good, isn't it? It's not bad. And then here's, so remember I was telling you when I, when I first started getting like interested in plants, I would always be on my hands and knees. Well, in, in Nevada, there are all these little belly flowers. They're about this tall. And so you're down there on your hands and knees looking at all these plants. This fillery right here, it's real common everywhere. It's another one of those plants that's really short. You have to get down there next to it to get a good picture. So get down and friendly with the plants. They won't hurt you. It's an awful lot of fun. Um, does everybody know what this is? Is St. John's wort? Have you seen it? Um, so the leaves of the St. John's wort, if you take a leaf and you hold it up to the light, you'll see a bunch of uh, holes in the leaf all the way around. It's uh, perfoliata. Perfoliatum is one of the, uh, it's the species uh, name. And that's how you can identify that one. This is uh, bumblebees in the backyard. Red clover makes great tea. Mullen, here's a mullen leaf. If you want to pass around a mullen leaf. And I got the smallest one I could find. <laughs> but these are really cool. <laughs> They're really woolly. Um, soft and woolly. And uh, you don't want to eat the seeds of, of this plant, but the leaves are really cool. Um, we get bronchitis just about every year or some kind of lung congestion. And if you take some of these big leaves and just put them in a... Uh, put them in a pot of water and simmer it slowly for a little while and then strain it out. It really does help your congestion. Same thing with, um, with the uh, curly cup gumweed. And it's just a little tiny, the curly cup is real kind of gooey resinous. And that makes really good tea. So you can go out and harvest, just clip them off and it'll be late summer before they're ready and clip them off and, and dry them. And it's gonna be hard for them to dry because they're real gooey, but, but bear with it and uh, have some nice tea for the winter time. This uh, flax is what was made, linen was made from flax, from the leaves of the flax. And you probably talk a little more about how to process that. A very important plant. And of course, uh, the seeds are awesome too. These, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about these guys. Um, you've all seen this one. Um, false hellebore, just avoid it. Don't even think about harvesting it. It's just a bad guy. I mean, it's a, it's a great guy to look at, but it's not a good guy to get too close to. Poison hemlock, same thing. Um, this is what, who was that, Socrates that got poisoned with uh, hemlock? Just don't even go there. If it looks like, if it looks like a parsley, leave it alone. <laughs> That's the best way to stay out of trouble. And um, so this is a beautiful plant, totally beautiful plant. Has anybody had uh, experiences with this plant? Yeah, me too, me too. Yikes! Um, they, so even looking like this, like dead stems, it'll still get you. So be aware where you're going. It hangs out at hot springs, unfortunately. Just like we like to hang out at hot springs, it does too. Uh, Columbine, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, that's a little salad I put together from our columbine plants, and we didn't need them, but they're really pretty just to garnish something with. They're just beautiful. 
Don't eat the seeds. Lynn's going to talk more about dogbane. It's a great plant for weaving. And then also watch out for these kinds of plants. If it's got a hood, don't, don't harvest it in general. That's, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. And then if it looks like a pea, if it looks like a buttercup, leave it alone. If it's real poiky, pokey like this uh, yellow star thistle, it'll bite you. <laughs> and it's not much fun. And here are some other ones. Um, <laughs> this is actually uh, poison hemlock up there. <laughs> and they had sprayed. <laughs> it was just a really funny looking plant. Uh, that they'd sprayed for it out at the uh, Fort Boise WMA, and all these, where they were just all, ah! <laughs> So if, the, if something's been sprayed, obviously don't harvest. Uh, nightshades, they have those little potato-looking blossoms on them. Don't, they're supposed to be good cooked. I've never eaten them cooked. I've eaten a lot of cooked, like potatoes, and, you know, the, their relatives, potatoes and peppers and um, okra, and, not okra, um, what's... Eggplant, thank you. And those are pretty good, but uh, in the wild, leave them alone. Uh, there's a little one, a little native one, looks like a tomatillo. Those are good to eat. If you don't know what it is, don't eat it. You know... My, my mom used to my mom used to do uh, mustard plasters. I don't know if anybody is it ever anybody okay. So mustard plasters is another thing that's kind of gone the wayside, and um, everybody's a little bit differently different. Our bodies are different, so just go slow if you're trying to do medicine or food and you're not familiar with it. Consider the source. Um, this is kind of a cool thing for caching food if you um, are interested in if you're being out there for a while and you want to cache some food. This is a way to get it done. And, you know, all this stuff. That's it. So thank you, everybody. And this is the one that makes it go forward. Okay. Okay. On the belt clip. I passed a handout around earlier, and I know a few of you may not have been here yet, so be sure if you want one, get it on the way out that's directly related to our talk. And then there are a couple other handouts back there on general plant ID. We didn't go into that, we're not going into that for the rest of time, but is this on? It's on? Okay. So, of course, plant ID is really important, but that would be a whole other class. So, thanks, Cindy, and thanks, Pam. It's fun to be here have a chance to talk with you all. How many of you have, have tried edible or medicinal wild plants? Oh, quite a few, great. How about other types of useful plants, like some kind of a tool? A few, not, not as many. Well, I bet most of you have, probably all of you, whether you know it or not, we've mostly, uh, we've usually used tools that were made, say our furniture may have come from wood that was grown in the wild, How, building materials, baseball bats, musical instruments, any of those kinds of things. But our ancestors around the globe, not just our ancestors here, but all over the globe, relied on native materials, the, the native plants, before, say before iron, before plastic, before mo many of our modern conveniences. And so that's what I wanna show you a little bit today. Let's see if I can get this to go forward. There it is. I want to talk to you a little bit about the tools. And I got a, a start or a look at how to make some of these tools at an event called Rabbit Stick, which is held each September near Rexburg. It's been held for more than 30 years. It's a week-long kind of a camp. There's adults and kids there, family people, uh, military people who are interested in more kind of basic survival type skills. And they teach a whole bunch of different um, primitive skills, they call it the ancient knowledge that our ancestors used to survive. And I'm only gonna focus on the plant part, but there's a whole nother kind of section that they teach on, oh, say tanning hides and making clothing and even smelting iron there. 
So this is uh, everything I'll talk about tonight is are things I learned at rabbit stick. It's named for a tool that's like a boomerang, a rabbit stick, literally a, a certain weighted stick that was thrown at small game to catch them, to harvest them. So and the first thing, one of the easiest things we learned is called a barehanded basket. It's made with the, the stems of willows that are ripped off and you don't have to have a, a knife. You can literally make it with bare hands. You don't have to have any tools. So you can tell this is a little tiny willow twig that the bottom's been ripped off off of, and I can pass, pass some of these around if you want to have a look. Um, so it was really handy. You could collect tools really, or collect your willows really quickly and make these kind of lightweight um, baskets. Oops, not my phone. There we go. Uh, here, Norm Kidder, who's a well-known um, primitive skills teacher, uh, is teaching us how to make these barehanded baskets, and you can use sandbar willow, which we, um, you might find around here. I think it grows around here. And, but this was over in eastern Idaho. Um, if you want to know, well, you just need the little, the little uh, small tops of the stems, which we would rip off and then take the leaves, strip the leaves off of them. And we could collect a bundle this big, like my friend has here, probably in about 15 minutes. So you could quickly collect enough to make a basket, and you didn't have to be fooling with big, long willow stems like bigger baskets would be made of. The most important thing when you're starting a basket is the bottom. And here you can see one kind of basket. You can see the little pulled off stems where it was pulled off of the plant there. And when people like Norm are trying to figure out how Native peoples made these baskets, they would look at those kinds of details try to figure out what they, just what they did. And the bottom is always the hardest part. The one I made myself has a really easy bottom, but I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, he showed us one that I want to try to remember because this is really a standard kind where you twine together um, eight straight stems, eight, eight straight uh, willow stems like this, and then you turn four of them on a 90 degree angle and just start twining around. And from that, that's one, really one of the basics. Yes? Are they dry like this or are they still These are fresh, yeah. freshly picked. Yes, they're still flexible. That's a great question, yeah. And as you can imagine, it's not too much from here just to keep twining around in and out, weaving in and out with a couple bent willow twigs and add in more and more stems as you, as you uh, work your way up. So that's kind of the basics of making a willow basket. It's a lot, it can be more complex if you want it to, but you could make yourself a simple basket this way. And then when you get to the top, you have all these sticks sticking out and you just fold the, fold the ends over and stuff them back in there however you like. There are fancy ways or kind of uh, traditionally correct ways if you want to say, but if you're just trying to make yourself a berry basket, you don't, don't have to be fancy about it. These were the baskets that my classmates and I made before we finished the tops. <laughs> so you can see all the long stems. And some of us wove them very open, like the middle one there. And some on the right-hand side are, are much more woven much more closely. So mine was wide open like this. This is actually not so much a basket. What do you think this would have been for? Yes, this is a scale model fishing trap. And they uh, might have had a set of twigs that poked in, that uh, put, um, that faced in, so the fish would be not in very inclined to, s to um, swim out, and it would be about this big instead, More like that. This was, this actual size, anybody have another idea? What m else might have been caught with something this size? What do you think? Oh, that's a great idea. I'm sure with one that was more finely woven, they could have cut crawdads with it. Uh-huh, that'd be great in the creek. I'm thinking of birds, actually. Especially woodpeckers would be caught with a trap this size. And some um, native peoples in Northern California especially like to have woodpecker feather capes. And so they would wait till the bird was inside the tree, sneak up, put that on the tree. <laughs> Too bad for the babies, but, uh, you know, but it was a way to, to catch the bird pretty, pretty handily.
Then there was another class taught by Callie Russell on more heavy duty willow baskets, you know, something more sturdy. This is not willow, but you know, something this size you could weave out of the longer willow stems, not just the little twigs. And you could carry a lot of weight in these bigger willow baskets. I mean, they'd be effectively be a backpack. She showed us that you can tell if a willow is good enough to use for this kind of, for any kind of weaving, if you can twist it around your finger without it breaking. Now these have dried a bit, but I can still twist it around my finger pretty much. And there are, are surprisingly few species of willow in Idaho that actually work this way, that are flexible enough to weave with. So she's demonstrating that there on the right, how to twist the willow around your finger. These have to be cut, so you've got to have either ply, either um, like garden clippers or a knife to cut them with, and you can see the cut ends here, the little the little little white cut ends. Obviously, uh, this is a lot more complex weaving skill, and she's had a lot lot of practice, so um, you can make heavy baskets that will last a long time, but it takes much more time and skill to do so. There are many different styles of bottoms of baskets, depending what you're doing with them. So, We made several other kinds of baskets at Rabbit Stick. What do you think uh, these might be made of? Cattails, yes, great. Cindy talked about those. Here's a little cattail basket. Oops, dump all the goodies out. So you can have a look at it. Um, and these were made by our teacher, Myron Creighton, Cretney, and uh, he's done a lot of cattail weaving, decades worth. In addition to cattails being really valuable for food, like Cindy talked about, their leaves are excellent for basket making. So first thing you do is cut them and dry them, and this helps the deep, kind of the water that's in the deep cells get dried out and then you have to rehydrate them to make them flexible enough to actually work with. So you might have to dry them for a week and then rehydrate them for a day or two to get them flexible enough to weave with. But I guess I can pass this around. It's fairly sturdy. Um, yeah. There's a, with any of these things, there's little tricks. Like with the cattails, they're a lot easier to weave with if you split them first, or at least you split the big thick cattails. Some of the thinner ones you could just weave with as they are. And you start out simply by plaiding a f the a four, you can do four, four, three or four or five stems, however, depending on how big you want your basket to be. And then you twist a set of cattail leaves around the plait that you made and work your way up pretty quick. You have something that looks like a bas little basket I'm passing around there. So that was my first basket, and this is Myron's basket. <laughs> I felt like a kindergartner most of the time there, but yeah, it was all fun. His, his baskets are works of art. <laughs> now, if you're really clever, you can make your basket into a hat. Because if you think of it, a hat is really just a basket with a brim on it. So the fellow on the left is learning to make a hat, and then Myron's wearing one that he wove from cattails. That's, uh, that's the kind of the, the artisan version of a cattail hat. We also use tulies or bulrushes. These are the great big things you see growing on the edge of the marsh. They have little, they look kind of like a round piece of grass, except it doesn't have any joints on the stem. And then it has little flowers on the top. You harvest them when the flowers are, when they're blooming. That's the, um, the, time, the best time to harvest them. You can make baskets, mats, a duck decoy if you need one, even a house. In Peru, uh, tule, ba tule boats are still commonly used for fishing. And Native peoples on the coast of California use tule boats as well. Very similar kind of idea. The stems of tules are spongy, and so they hold air, and they float really well. So I can pass this around. If... 
for you to have a look at up close. Yeah. The toolies that we use, the bulrushes, are Chairmaker's bulrush. They're all taller than we were, so good six feet tall. And uh, as I said, you get them when they're flowering. You have to dry them also. An armful, my, like my friend here has, would probably make that bas a basket about that size or something a little bigger. You split them first, like the cattails, split them when they're wet, and then dry them. And then you rehydrate them, and, you, and that makes them flexible again, so you can weave with them. Like anything, the bottom was the hardest part. Um, this one's always a challenge to recreate. Then once you get going, though, once you learn um, how to set up the bottoms of the baskets, then it's kind of just meditative. You just go round and round. Turn the sides up when the bottom's as big as you want. And voila, a basket. <laughs> Well, another thing you can make, well, here's my first basket, my first and only tule basket so far. So you can have a look at that. And there, you can see each of the um, plant materials have kind of different uh, characteristics in terms of strength or flexibility. There you go. And you can also make a, a knife sheath out of tules. This was a knife sheath like Utsi, the Swedish man, Swiss man who was found in the ice. This was the kind of knife sheath he was wearing. It was made of tules. Isn't that cool? Rushes can be woven into small baskets, small lightweight baskets, and they're sometimes easier to find than the great big tulies. So. Certainly easier to harvest. Another thing we learned besides baskets was how to make cordage. And let's see, dog bane, which you can see big piles of dog bane here. Cindy mentioned the dog bane that um, is poisonous, is toxic, but also has many uses. And it naturally has a lot of fiber in the bark. So you can see the fibers just splitting off of this stem here. And this can be basically broken off. You, you kind of you break the bark and just peel off the inside, that pithy inside. And you're left with a pure string of fiber, which you can then moisten and twist into rope. And I'll show you in a minute how the rope twisting works. But I'll pass this around, and you can see there are certain plants, like linen that Cindy mentioned, that are useful for um, fibers. Can you think of another one? Any of this? Milkweed. Here's the, the method that Alice Tulloch was teaching us to use, where you basically strip down the fiber on the outside and then break off the pith. And you have to do it in little segments. Otherwise, it just rips right off the stem. And so there's all these tricks to each kind of tool that we were making. Um, and so that was the one for dogbane to help you get big, long strings of fiber. There she's pulled that whole, you know, she was able to break the pith off about an inch or two at a time and have a big, long strip. Then you can twirl that and twine more in, just feed more in as you're going along. <laughs> Here, uh, Min, is, Min is twisting on the left, but you shouldn't put this stuff in your mouth because it's, it is poisonous, as Cindy mentioned. So. It's less, I'm sure it's less poisonous when the stems are dried, and you only harvest it when the stems are dried. So that, that white sap it has pretty much gone away by then. But, and here, Patricia's holding up a little string she made. That probably took two, her two hours. <laughs> a little piece of string that long. But I'm sure it goes faster once you learn the technique. Here's the dog bane before it's dried. I wanted to show it to you when you knew what it, so you'd know what it looks like when it's alive. And usually you'll find dead dried stems from last year hanging out with the, the, um, the fresh material because it comes back year after year in the same place. So. And the milkweed has the same property. This is a milkweed stem right here, and you can see some of the fibers that are starting to break out of the milkweed stem. Then we made a giant grass rope, <laughs> partly for fun, but also so that people would learn the um, uh, principles, I guess, of making rope. And what we did is we cut down this canary reed grass. It's kind of a weedy reed canary grass. It's kind of a weedy grass. 
and laid it out like two railroad tracks and then got a whole bunch of people to stand there and turn, just twist. We meshed it together, so to speak, at the top, meshed the bundles together and had them turn, and pretty quickly a rope starts forming. How ropes are formed is this principle of two strands that are turning the same way and then they begin to twist back on themselves. And it's much stronger than the material alone. And you tie a big knot at the end and let the games begin. <laughs> And here's the principal, uh, Thomas Elpel, who wrote Botany in a Day, was teaching this class. And so here he's demonstrating the principle of two pieces of cordage that are twisted around each other. We were using, as I mentioned, we were using reed canary grass. I think you could use cereal rye in the foothills in the same way. I haven't tried it, but it's a tall grass that's been planted all over the foothills. It's non-native. And you can even eat the cereal rye if you'd like because it's the same domestic rye that we grow in our fields. So it should work for grass ropes too. Then the la uh, one of the last categories, I think I have one or two more here, is um, friction fire. Plant materials were essential to fire. We couldn't probably, I can't think of any other type of fire making that didn't involve plant materials uh, in the days before iron. Flint and steel is another story, but we, we, use, we learned both bow drill fires on the left and hand drill fires on the right. Same principle, you just have, it's just a matter of whether you're using a bow or your hands. The most important thing is that the drill or spindle has to be straight. If you're trying to do it with a curved piece of wood, you won't get enough friction at the bottom to, to generate enough heat to make an ember. So there's also other little tips like carving a hole in the end of the spindle. I don't know if you can see that here. But um, that helps concentrate the pressure over just certain areas. And you also use certain types of wood for the fireboard. See these holes here? You put the spindle in and then the fireboard is notched in such a way that when you spin it, the ember will drop out onto a piece of bark or leaf that you've set up. And I've got a fire board here somewhere. Pass around a small one. This one, this one. You can kind of get the idea. You can see how it works and, and how the notch, the uh, spindle fits right in the notch in the fire board. So you said at the bottom of it, you, put, you carved the bottom out? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's, you can see when it comes around, there's actually a little hole in the bottom so that most of the pressure is on a donut shaped oh. surface. Once you catch the ember on your, say, a piece of bark, as I have here, then you put it on a pile of tinder that you have waiting nearby and blow on it very gently. And if you're lucky, pretty quickly you'll have a fire. This takes about 15 minutes of, of um, twirling to get enough heat to get it heated up. And it's definitely a skill that you can learn some finesse and you get better at, but it's not as easy as I thought it would be. It's not like <laughs> rubbing two sticks together. It doesn't work that way. Uh. Another trick about making fire by friction is that certain types of plant materials work better than others. So the drills, if they make a fine powder-like char when you spin them, the drills or spindles, then they're going to make uh, be better for making fire. And so the species on top that I've put an exclamation after, those are the ones that are the best around here, or the best in Idaho that we have. And then these others will also work, but they might take you longer. Same with the fireboards or the hearths. They, um, certain materials are better than others. And also certain combinations of the two seem to work better than others. And the last uh, thing I'll talk about making are gourd canteens. Gourds were actually native to Africa, but the native peoples were using them in North America by the time Columbus arrived. They had already gotten here, probably According to genetic studies, they'd probably come over, floated over on the ocean, is the best guess, instead of coming across the Bering Strait. And so this is a gourd canteen that we made. You get these ugly moldy gourds, clean them up in the river with sand, and then use the sharpened willow stick to dig the insides out. Also use some river gravel and swirl it around. 
If you slosh it straight back and forth, you're liable to blow a hole in the side of your gourd, so you've got to swirl it around with the little gravels and stone. And then get your teacher, in this case it was Cody Lundeen, to um, help you tie up a fancy holder for it, and instant gourd. So instant water holder. Of course, the whole family had to have gourds, gourd, <laughs> gourd canteens. <laughs> We also made a few plates and bowls um, just for fun when we got home. So you can, I don't think I'll pass these around because they're kind of fragile, but um, you can carve them, burn, burn them with wood burning tools, that kind of thing. They're, they make excellent uh, dishes. Now I'll just cover a couple last things, not that I made, but things I saw around camp or found. Uh, I bought this from a gal there who made it made a purse from a willow bark bottom, piece of willow bark, and then birch bark top. And then I made this dogbane cord. Remember I showed the dogbane cordage? This, that's what this is made of. So. Let's see, I can pass that around. I think it's sturdy enough. Um, we made pine needle baskets there. And then someone had made an ax with, from stone, and we actually could chop wood with it. <laughs> this was designed after an ax found in an archaeological site. What do you think that is? Any guesses? A what? It it's, has a really similar um, principle like bamboo, really similar, um, but it's actually not bamboo. Yeah, bamboo is a giant grass, and this is an agave stem. They grow in the southwest, like century plants grow in the southwest. Yes. Yep, some of those rain sticks are the same principle. And when I made this, uh, we, I split the stem, hollowed it out, and then glued it and tied it back together. It's, uh, just a, I can't remember if we used high, a hide glue, probably, the fellow had made. This would be pretty good for keeping your arrows in, right? <laughs> Did I lose something? No. All right, I guess I'll pass that around. It's pretty sturdy. Let's see what else. Well, one or two more. What do you think that is? I'll give you a hint. It was This was the hunting class. <laughs> a what? I didn't hear. A bobber. That's a, that's a good idea. Yes, it's some kind of call. Cow, you could cow call with it or predator call with it. There's... Uh, they've made a little hole in the middle and put a grass reed through it. So. And this is the last one. Any guesses on this? <laughs> yeah, marshmallow got too close to the fire. What do you think it is? Excellent, it is. I can't believe you guessed that. You're the first one <laughs> ever. This is a, this was a giant blob of pitch sap tree sap that um, you heat up for about 15 minutes, cook it, and strain it, strain the impurities out of it, and then add a little bit of moose pellets, which is ground up plant fiber, right? It happens to have passed through moose, and some charcoal out of the fire. And, the, and that makes a really strong glue. How does strain? With cheesecloth oh. would work, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or a strainer would work, pardon? You can use it to haft arrows, if you're a better arrow maker than I am. <laughs> um, you can use it to, to, to put arrows together, put your points on arrows, say bird points, little bird points or whatever. And this is a very strong glue. So, cool. Yeah, isn't that fun? So there are lots of other things uh, going on at Rabbit Stick too. There were plant ID courses, edible and medicinal plant courses and those kinds of things. But since, since Cindy was covering that, I just wanted to show you some of the things that were a little bit different in ways of plant tools. And I hope you'll get a chance to try some of these things. It's great fun to think about what our ancestors did, how they used these tools and how we might um, practice those skills too. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Nope. So you oh. add the, the moose pellets in, into that to mm -hmm. add the organic matter? I think it probably just makes it a little more, more sturdy somehow. Okay. I don't know what goes on chemically. So you don't want to eat it? 
<laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Do you have a question? Would you melt that and then apply it to your project? Yes, exactly. Like you could mix it all up and and then or keep it keep just carry the pitch around with you in blobs, carry the pitch around and then when you need some glue make it and it hardens into like that. Okay. Huh? I don't know. I haven't tried that, but I kind of think it would. Because you wouldn't want to, like, every time you needed a bit of glue to have to go to the whole process of filtering and filtering the resin and all that again. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, this was pine pitch. I think they said when you mix the charcoal in, the only caveat was don't use charcoal from a pine tree. Use, use a different kind of wood. I have no idea why. But I think any pitch you can find would probably work. Uh-huh. I don't know if I missed this. How do you clean the board after it gets dry? Oh, that is a great question. That sharp stick, that sharp willow stick, gets a lot of the inside out. So when a gourd dries, the inside kind of draws up against the walls and a little bit in the middle. So it's not like it's solid as, as a squash would be. Um, so you're able to jab a lot of it out with the stick and just shake it out and the seeds come out. And then we put it in the, in the um, river. We put some river gravels in there, small pieces of gravel, and swirl them around. And that did pretty well, but mine still kind of smelled. My friends didn't, but mine still did. So I got a high-tech um, barbecue fork shaved the tines off, folded them, and used that to scrape the rest out. <laughs> the paleo barbecue fork, that'll do it. <laughs> Other questions? We're probably about out of time, but uh, it's been great chatting with you, and there are a few handouts back there, or come look at the books. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.